Sasha Thompson is a highly respected DEI expert and certified coach. She and her network of friends in the DEI profession often talk shop after work. They're bringing those after hours conversations to you right here on DEI After Five with Sasha. Let's get this conversation started. Hello, 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 and welcome to the first episode of DEI After Five. I am so excited about today um, because my first guest is really someone that, you know, when the stars align and you just happen to meet and you just connect, um, we, we had that type of connection. And I thought it was so important to start the show off with this particular topic because it is the foundation of this work, particularly for DEI practitioners. And so my guest today is Farah Harris, who is a therapist that focuses on um, emotional intelligence. And so just want to welcome you, Farah, to today's show. I am so excited to be here. And yes, the stars did align <laughs> and they danced and we're now here together having we this are conversation. Here. Yes. This is Thank exciting. you. So much for, for joining. You know, as we started to kind of get to know each other and I don't even remember how we connected somewhere on LinkedIn, somewhere, somewhere, um, we started to just see each other's work mm-hmm. and just started to like, yes, okay, yes, yes. <laughs> and I think, you know, one of the pieces that um, you wrote that really resonated with me was about emotional intelligence and the importance of it for practitioners. And I think it spoke to me because at that time, I was dealing with um, some people in DEI that were not very emotionally intelligent. And I was seeing the the challenges that come along with that. So um, if you could just talk to us a little bit about what is emotional intelligence, like, <laughs> before we even dive into the conversation, because I think people hear EQ, but they don't necessarily know what it means. Yes, yes. And the more I do this work, the the limiting uh, views that I'm, I'm recognizing that people have, you know, it's about um, if you want to have high EQ, that, that allows you to be a great uh, person at work in terms of performance, but it's a strength skill, not a soft skill. I don't like calling it a soft mm-hmm. skill. Um, that that we all need um, because it usually highlights four domains depending on you know what school of, of uh, EQ experts you follow sometimes it's five sometimes it's six but it's really these core four of being self-aware which is being able to be in tune with yourself how you're feeling being aware of your emotions um, self-management or self-control or self-regulation that's just uh as i call it with the ice cubes you better check yourself before you wreck yourself mm-hmm. it's just being able to know like oh these are the feelings that i'm having right now and how can i make sure that i'm controlling them and managing them well and then the social awareness is just being able to read the room this is where I, mm-hmm. it's important as practitioners as leaders uh to have eq because that social awareness is where that action of empathy comes in and this is when you're able to kind of see the other person's point of view and then relationship management. Um, this is how you inspire people. This is how you motivate people. This is how you effectively communicate and, and manage conflict. So those are the typical domains and competencies that make EQ. Uh, but when you really think about it, it is something that's more than just a professional development skill. It's a personal development. I'm teaching my kids how to be emotionally intelligent because as you said, you were, we're in the workplace and we talk to a lot of people who let's just say their EQ is not that high and, and it creates uh-huh. lots of stress um, and toxicity and unhealthy relationships within and out of the workplace. You know, as you were talking, um, a couple of things, you know, just started popping in my head because that's how it usually happens when you and I talk. Yeah. Um, and, you know, it just clicked for me that one of the challenges that I'm noticing, right, with, with some of my coaching clients, particularly that are practitioners, is they're in environments where they're expected to do this work, right? Do exceptional in this work, move mountains in situations where systems aren't going to be shifted, mm-hmm. to be honest. Um, and they're dealing with leadership with low EQ, right? So it's this 
basically almost impossible situation. Yeah. Um, how, how, how do you even survive or how do you even start to operate? in an environment like that because that that's emotionally taxing like i know enough to know that that will pull out like frustration anger all of those things and so yeah. how do you manage that it, it's a mix of um I, I think about when michelle obama did the one you know they go ho low we go mm -hmm. high and so i've kind of adopted it when you get low eq you get you you know you go high eq so it mm -hmm. is about increasing your own emotional intelligence but with that healthy boundaries are so important you can't um, continue to try to will somebody to 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 elevate and to to move up on the emotional uh, intelligence quotient without being like as you said angry, frustrated, disappointed. So there's sometimes you have to just learn how to walk away, um, mm. minimize some conversations that you recognize is is not going to be fruitful. Um, you know, there's the saying when you argue with the fool from the outside, nobody can tell the difference. Like there's, uh -huh. you need to just know, okay, this isn't, this is going, this isn't going to be beneficial. However, when I said earlier that I'm teaching my kids how to elevate their own emotional intelligence, I can't teach it to them without modeling it. And so the thing is that if you are wanting to kind of change the environment, I believe we change an environment one person at a time. So if you're a practitioner, if you are a leader, if you are a parent, whatever it is, how are you making sure you're checking yourself before you wreck yourself? How are you regulating your own emotions? How are you adapting? Um, you know, emotional intelligence helps us to be agile. Right now, within the last two years, we've dealt with a lot of constant adjustment, right? The ebbs and flows due to the pandemic. How have you managed through that? Your mm -hmm. children, your peers, your teammates, your 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 leaders are watching how you are emotionally uh, adapting to whatever is going around you, and they take they take note of that. And so, the more you're able to elevate your own emotional intelligence, I, I do believe it's a ripple effect. But then there are just some people who there's so much work they have left to do. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, many people need to be on several therapist couches to, to process you know, um, how they, they deal with feelings and deal with, with change. Um, and, and that's usually what we're having uh, conversations about is we're trying to instill change in these places, right? And so we're trying uh -huh. to create a new and healthier culture, but change scares a lot of people because uncertainty brings fear. And if you haven't worked on your emotions and processing how you usually interact when fear comes to your doorstep, then yeah, you're going to get resistance and you're going to get pushback. And so when we're able to um, have emotional intelligence and be emotionally intelligent practitioners and emotionally intelligent uh, leaders, we're also in a way trauma-informed leaders, right? We're, mm -hmm. we're able to understand that people come with their own stuff it really does not get left at the door. They come with their own stuff and it is presented in our interpersonal relationships. And so the more you're able to go like, mm, you seem to always deal with uncertainty, with, with anger. <laughs> you know, that, that seems to be the first emotion that, that pops up. How can I lower that threat threshold? So that's not your immediate response when we're in this space. You know, you, you hit on something earlier, hit on a couple of things, but the one that's like really sitting with me is EQ is almost the opposite of um, American corporate culture. Oh yes, <laughs> right. It's the it's the opposite because you're not supposed to show emotion. Um, you're not, you know, you're supposed to think, be logical, right, mm -hmm. and not with your heart, right, your head versus the heart. And what you're doing, or what what EQ is asking people to do, is to shift that paradigm. It's to connect the head and the heart. It's to be able to name and identify what those emotions are. Um, and But if you're in corporate spaces or if you're in space, I'm not going to even just put it on corporate. If you're in spaces where emotion is seen as a negative thing, mm -hmm. right? How do you start to shift that? Um, and so that's, I think, a difficult place to be because again, I'm, I'm just thinking through some of the facilitations that I do and 
You know, we're always saying, you know, connect the head and the heart. What are you feeling? Like name the emotion. And it's like pulling teeth with some people because it is just so counter it's to counter. how they have grown up or, you know, you yes. don't show those things in the workplace. Yes. Um, and, but and yet the they go through these experiences where they see EQ is like inclusive leaders have high mm -hmm. EQ. Mm -hmm. Yeah, supposedly. Um <laughs> Right. You know, that, that's what is marketed because there is an understanding that this is an important skill. But the question that I ask whenever I do trainings around emotional uh, intelligence is the question that I think, one, because of my background in psychotherapy, is understanding the root of the cause, the action, the behavior, the thinking, whatever. So the question is that I ask is, what is your emotional narrative? How did you learn about feelings? Because we can't talk about emotional intelligence if we don't talk about emotions. And when people slow down and think, wait, how did I learn about feelings? Because we have our family of origin that maybe your background was, um, you, you know, you heard in your family, uh, boys don't cry. And we hear that in society too, right? Yeah. Or, you know, quit all that crying or maybe you watched people put things under the rug and put on appearances, but you could cut the tension with a knife, uh -huh. you know? Um, or maybe your family did uh, perhaps express emotions, but it was violent or aggressive. And so when you are able to actually go, oh, this is actually how I learned about feelings. This is how I learned either to be comfortable or have discomfort with certain feelings. Maybe there's you know emotions I'm comfortable with within myself, but I'm not, comfortable watching someone grieve or I'm not comfortable mm. watching someone be anxious that causes discomfort in me. Where did that come from? So if we can get back to that narrative, understanding the stories behind feelings, we talk about, uh, you know, research shows over and over again that women make great leaders uh, because we have high EQ because we're very socially aware, typically, not all of us, but in general, mm -hmm because the maternal instinct is to be able to read the, the nonverbal cues of an infant, right? And so uh -huh. we're constantly seeing like, well, they made this noise, they squirmed this way or whatever. And we, especially in crises, as women who are leaders, we're able to kind of pick up those nonverbal cues inherently just because of the way that we're wired. But we also have society that told men, the best emotion that you can have that shows power and strength is anger. So yeah. there's not this freedom to be tender, to, to show sadness or to show fear. And so again, these last two years where there's all this uncertainty, there are men who are frightened right now and not in a negative way, but they are frightened because they don't know. Um, mm -hmm. And they are not given the freedom because as children, they weren't given the, the vocabulary or the space to process fear or to process sadness and grief. So they show up angry or aloof. All the time, yep. yep. <laughs> That's not gonna work as we're watching the workplaces change and like you're saying, connecting that head and heart, we're dealing with people. And maybe back in the day when it was just like, we're just all about widgets and and and, and, God, and, yep. and <laughs> becoming, you know, becoming the machines to just put things together. No, we, we're not doing that anymore. And so the whole people aspect is having us re-look at how do we really engage? What is that interpersonal relationship really looking like? How is it healthy? Mm -hmm. How is it beneficial? How does it impact the workplace? But before we can talk about EQ as, you know, you're a motivator, you're, you inspire, let's first talk about, well, how do you deal with feelings, period? Right. <laughs> you know, because if you're not comfortable with them, then how are you going to be able to address the myriad of emotions that your team members may bring? How are you going to anticipate mm -hmm. their anxiety? How are you going to, like I said earlier, lower that threat threshold? How are you going to be able to communicate with them effectively if you can't even you know, process your own emotions well and, and then therefore are trying to manage the emotions of others? It's just, it's just not gonna work. You know, it's the word that keeps coming to mind as you're talking is empathy. Like we keep hearing, especially around, you know, for practitioners and folks that facilitate and do a lot of work in this space, empathy is the word, word of the day. I'm just going to put it out there like that. Um, 
But now that now as I'm listening to you and I'm taking a step back, they're, the practitioners themselves, right, beyond throwing out the word of empathy, have to have this EQ, right? Have to be able to know how to identify the own emotion, the emotions that they have, the feelings that they have before that they can see that or read the room right. in a facilitation. You know, um, I was thinking I, I did a facilitation. My days are starting to blend together. I don't know, a couple of weeks ago. Yeah. And as we were doing it, I noticed that the women of color left the room. Hmm. And when they came, when we stopped that part of the facilitation and folks came back, one of them said, I don't think anybody even noticed that we left the room. And a couple of people said like, oh yeah, we didn't notice. Oh, we thought you had to go to the bathroom. I picked up on, okay, someone's emotional, right? I couldn't read what the emotion was, but I saw that there was an emotion um, mm -hmm. and what somebody left and another woman of color followed her. Right. So I circled back with them later to have a conversation. And I mean, I think it was probably helpful to them that I noticed it, mm -hmm. but it was also frustrating <laughs> to them that it took, it was only another woman of color that recognized it. Can, can I speak to that? <laughs> go, go for it. Go for it. Because um, I mean, it, it was one of those like, I saw it. You didn't see it? <laughs> like, Yeah. Okay. So, so when we're talking about empathy and, and there's different levels of empathy, there's cognitive empathy. That's just, you know, if I think about what this could be like, okay, I guess they would feel this, you know, um, and then there's empathy that's like rooted in compassion. So that's in your heart because mm -hmm. you can be empathetic um, and you can have high EQ, high EQ and actually be very manipulative, you know? So uh -huh. there, there is this, this, this thin line between having a high emotional intelligence and being ethical and being humane and being kind and being compassionate. And then you can have high EQ to be able to manipulate and be deceptive. Um, uh -huh. You know, the sociopaths <laughs> can be empathetic, right. you know, and so so we have to be very careful on, you know, what is it rooted in that empathy? Is is it our values? Is it connected to to our heart? Um, but I often say that um, it's hard for you to read the room if you are part of the majority, because mm -hmm. in a way the room was created for you. So I give this example um, when I do my trainings and I'm like, how many people are right handed? And, you know, the majority of people raise their hand. And I said, OK, I'm 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 a Gen Xer. So I don't know how the school looks like now. But back in the day, you know, the desks and the chair were connected and they were set up for a right handed person. Mm -hmm. The pencil sharpener was for the right handed person. And it wasn't until my sister, my younger sister, who happens to be a lefty, I started to realize how she navigates the world of a right handed as a left handed person in a right handed world. Notebooks, the spirals mm -hmm. <laughs> are on a side so that you don't get, you know, your wrist marked if you're a right handed person. And so once I bring that connection, I said, I walked into those classrooms not wondering if I belonged there because I knew subconsciously that it was designed with me in mind. But yeah. when you have rooms that weren't designed with you in mind, um, you are always looking to see where you fit in. If you're a person that's a paraplegic, you know, is it accessible? You know, all of these things And when we were practitioners, we're trying to think of, right? We're trying to help others be more curious about other people's lived experiences. That's how we right. gain empathy. That's how we uh, grow and become uh, kinder and, and more inclusive with the people who don't have the same lived experience at us, as us. Uh, I did one training, um, and in the conversation, as we were prepping, one of the attendees had a, 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 a hearing impairment and she was like, oh, the closed captions are gone, you know, and and I actually like for you to be on the screen because I, I read lips. This is stuff that we don't think about, even with technology. You know, how many of us wants to turn our screen off? You know, we got Zoom fatigue, but we're not aware that there's somebody else that may need us when we're speaking to see our faces so that they can actually feel like they're included in the conversation. Um, mm -hmm. They're looking for the closed captions um, because as able 
able-bodied people, as 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 those of, who of us who don't have disabilities, or I take that back, not able-bodied, but those that don't have disabilities, right? Um, we we don't think about the other experiences. We're not empathizing. Um, I have a phrase, you know, things don't become near to dear to us until they become near to yeah. us. Mm -hmm. And so until we actually brush up against somebody else's lived experience, we just won't see it. And so those poor, you know, black women who walked out and already felt like you didn't see me while I was in there. So I doubt you'll notice that I'm gone. Yeah. And, and then I'm going to come back. And how does that feel? Well, our brain registers that as rejection and our brain registers rejection as pain. So they were physically feeling pain in that moment because it's like, OK, I'm 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 invisible. I'm not fully welcomed here. I don't belong. Um, yeah. And that is going to obviously impact somebody's well-being. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, I think there's just so much in that. And the reason why I, I, did, I did that sigh was because I think there's so many practitioners that talk a good game. They know all the words, they know all the vocabulary, but it's the actions yeah. um, and and how, how it manifests outside of the words, right? And, and I use the example, like one of the challenges that I had when I was in the corporate, um, <laughs> we did this inclusion 101 workshop and we used the example of what happened at Starbucks, mm -hmm. right? These men, you know, minding their business, work, doing their work and somebody came in and didn't like what was happening. And so rather than saying something to them, called the police. Mm -hmm. And our head of D and I, who was a white woman who had never done this work before, so very low EQ, um, didn't like something that I did, a, a social media post, mm -hmm. didn't say anything to me, went to the VPHR. And so I had to use, I'm like, you talk about this every single day. You use the Starbucks example. Let me break down how what you did is exactly what happened mm -hmm. at Starbucks. Mm -hmm. And when I did that, like the look on her face was like, oh, I did. She couldn't say it, mm -hmm. but it was that connection point that of awareness. It, that, right. It's like, okay, I'm not just regurgitating words. Like this is what it looks like mm -hmm. in real life, in real time. And the impacts, because I ended talking about the impacts. I was like, you got your feelings hurt, right? Over a post that had nothing to do with you. Um, but you got to walk away. Now oh, I wow. have to sit here and talk to the VP point. of HR, right? Mm -hmm. The VP of sales, the VP of market, like all of these leaders, because you didn't feel like I was doing my job, but I was doing my job. Yeah. And so and it, that, that connection piece, it, it's hard. And, you know, and that is where it's so important to be self-aware, you know, yeah. and, and self-awareness is not just, oh, what am I feeling? But it's also what am I doing and what am I saying that is and how is it landing on the other? Like, how do I show up and how does it affect others? So, yeah. um, you know, which requires feedback. And I know folks don't like feedback. You hear that word and it's like, mm, no, that makes me uncomfortable. But how do you really know who you are to others? You may have an idea of what you, you, you know, what you do and, and, and how you say things, but until you hear it, until you kind of get that, that, that echo back to you, that mirror being held up for you um, by another person, you don't really know. You have a good idea, but there's blinders. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and so when you have somebody that you can trust, that you have respect for, because it's not always a family member or friend. Sometimes some really good feedback can come from somebody that you don't like, <laughs> but they, they got nothing to lose. So they're going to be straight up honest with honest, you. Honest, yep. And how can you use your self-management to take something that stings and to process it and to, you know, go, OK, I, I don't like the way it came out, but is there some truth in this? Is right. there something that I can learn from this? Um, ouch, that hurt, but thank you for your feedback. Um, it, it's going to have me reflect on things because it goes back to that question of like, 
What is your emotional narrative? Where did you learn about feelings? Where did you learn that this behavior was okay? Many times people continue to do certain things because there were never any real consequences to mm -hmm. their behavior. You know, they just kept mm -hmm. getting enabled after, you know, enabled after, you know, enabled relationships. And it's like, okay, I'm not going to do the enabling anymore. I'm going to tell you straight up, you know, when you do this or when you say things like this, this is, this is how it makes other people feel. Um, and a person that has high EQ, uh, and, and let me make a note here. EQ is a constant practice. So you right. can't just, you know say, I have high emotional intelligence. You had high emotional intelligence in this instance. <laughs> right. Because you could have had an excellent conversation, a great 360, you know, review with someone. And then you went home and you cussed out your husband. So, right. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So when, when we talk about EQ, it's like, no, we're constantly working on elevating it. We're constantly working on building that muscle um, and recognizing that every time we communicate with others, we engage with others, it's an opportunity to elevate our emotional intelligence. It's not necessarily that we, it will happen, uh, that we will respond in a, uh, with high emotional intelligence. We may be tired. And mm -hmm. because we're tired and we haven't slowed ourselves down to question, is this a good time to have this, this conversation or should I wait until later? And you dive into the conversation and you're curt and you're short and you're rude and you're dismissive. Okay, well, then you weren't using your emotional intelligence mm -hmm. in, in that moment. You were just responding emotionally, but not being able to slow yourself down. Um, I have a a saying that you have to walk the dog, you know? So for those of you all who are dog <laughs> owners, um, there is that show, The Dog Whisperer, and Caesar was teaching his clients like how to walk their dog. And he said, you don't want the dog to be in front of you because that means it's in control and it's dominant. You don't want it to be behind you. You want the dog to be walking right next to you. And I'm like, that's the perfect picture of what mm -hmm. emotional intelligence is, specifically self-awareness, and self-management. You don't want your emotions to be guiding you because that's when you're going from zero to 100, <laughs> you know, when you, yeah. or, or people who quote unquote wear their emotions on their sleeves. You don't want it to be behind you because you can't see what's coming. You know, you could be walking Clifford, the big red dog. <laughs> and you think it's no a clue. And you're like, oh, I didn't know that was back there. And so that's very passive or passive aggressive behavior. So when you're able to walk with your feelings, you can see your feelings, you can engage with them, you can manage and control them. That is when you're practicing high emotional intelligence. And practitioners, as you say, can talk a good game, but they're not always actually walking it out because they may never have been challenged to. So what are some things that people can do to increase their EQ? like starting today? Because I think there are going to be folks that are watching this that are like, ooh, yeah, I, I got to <laughs> walk this dog a little differently. I got to <laughs> pull, pull back on, on that leash. Um, yeah. You can do immediately. Uh, we often don't self-audit ourselves enough. You know, mm. to slow ourselves down and really go, you know, how's Farah doing? How, how's Sasha doing? So what you can do to start elevating your emotional intelligence, which is really being in tune with how you feel in real time, walking your, the dog, so to speak, is twice a day. First thing in the morning, take 60 seconds, ask yourself or state, how am I feeling? And, and, and call it out. I am excited you know maybe something's happening during the day i'm not sure or i'm uh -huh. anxious or i'm frustrated and when you name the emotion maybe you want to write it down for those who like to journal maybe you write it down don't judge it because as a clinician right. i'm aware that there are so many times that we will add an emotion to an emotion and that ends up being so you know fruitless because it's like okay now you're so focused on the secondary emotion we're not even getting to the root of why you felt that first emotion to begin with so just name it just say you know i'm writing it down i woke up excited before you go to bed um, you know, name the emotion, you know, relieved, um, satisfied, content, angry, maybe it's still anxious. I'm not sure. But what you want to do is practice that first thing in the morning, right before you go to bed and do that for a few days and then start increasing the frequency during lunchtime. Ask yourself, how am I feeling at dinner time? How am I feeling? Uh -huh. uh, on your way home, how am I feeling? So the more you increase the feeling, the more you're actually becoming self-aware. Because, you know, if we sometimes have our emotions 
show up, but the way that we understand how we actually felt comes way after the moment. Like, right. oh, now that I think about it, I actually felt this. So when we start practicing walking the dog by, you know, doing that twice a day check in, then making it three times a day, then four times a day, you will find yourself realizing how many emotions you have throughout the day um, and how you actually respond to it. You know, how you can assess, well, what brought this feeling? Because that's that's the next step. You know, after you're aware of your emotion, the next step is to ask, well, where did it come from? OK, you know, some people are. are not the ones you need to talk to first thing in the morning because they haven't had their coffee, <laughs> they haven't had something to eat, whatever it is. So ask yourself, okay, I'm anxious. Why am I anxious? Right. What what is bringing that emotion up for me? Um, my kids know I'm a person that needs to like take a shower and eat breakfast. And so when they start asking mommy, mommy, and I go, mommy is still tired and has not fully woken. If you want to have a conversation. It's not going to be a good conversation if you don't let mommy have like 15 minutes of quiet so she can eat. And then I'll be able to communicate better with you. They get it. They mm -hmm. immediately know. I, I'm one of those people that gets hangry. Like if I'm hungry, <laughs> don't talk to me, you know, but right. I'm aware of that. And because I'm aware of that, and this is another thing that EQ does, the more you are aware of yourself and how emotions play, you can more effectively communicate that to others. So I can tell my kids, I don't want to be dismissive to you. Let mommy have five minutes. Then we can have a conversation. As a leader, you can do the same thing. When you recognize that you have a certain emotion, is this really the best time to have a conversation with a peer? Is this really the best time to hold a meeting? You might have to go, you know what? This is not the best time right now. Can we reconvene mm -hmm. in 30 minutes? That is. It's how we effectively communicate. That's how we minimize causing hurt to others uh, because we're we're walking the dog well. I love it. So how can people connect to you? I know how to get to me. <laughs> I know. Sure you can text me. Um, well, so if you want to learn more about the work that I do uh, in, in the workplace, not as a therapist, I do not see clients uh, right now, but around workplace well-being and, and creating places of belonging, um, it, you can visit my website at workingwelldaily.com. And um, you can follow me on the interwebs at workingwelldaily.com. I mean, workingwelldaily on Instagram. Uh, and, you know, if you want to also follow Twitter, I, I do share a lot of my thoughts there uh, and on LinkedIn. And that's at Far Harris LCPC. And uh, I, I am also currently writing a book. And I was just going to so, mention that. <laughs> yes, yes. And so if you want to learn more about not just what emotional intelligence is, but how it's been impacted by inequity and in that those of us who have been historically marginalized use our emotional intelligence in a different way. Um, check out my book, hopefully to be published next year. It's called The Color of Emotional Intelligence. Um, but there is a training and a, 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 a keynote of the same title, uh, that that I love sharing with with uh, workplaces and and different audiences wanting to learn how to raise their EQ so that they can create psychologically safe spaces for those who are historically marginalized. I love it, Farah. Thank you so much for joining me today. I, I just knew this conversation was just going to hit it out the park because I think it's it's critical, right? It's critical in this work. I think it's critical in life. Yes. You know, like you said, you do this at home. Um, I probably need to do more of this at home. But <laughs> um, thank you so much for joining us today. And I just want to thank our audience for uh, joining us today for this first episode of DEI After Five. Yay. And if you want to uh, follow more of what we're doing, you can just go to my website, which is www.theequityequationllc.com or just follow me on LinkedIn or on Instagram at The Equity Equation. So thank you all so much and hopefully you will join us at our next episode. Bye-bye.